Okay. Okay. Right, I think we're all here. We're probably going to be here if any light comes from the one there. Okay. Not quite that. Uh, Hello. <laughs> right, we'll make a start then. So, we're going to look today at working with DAS modeling clay. Now, is there anybody who's never ever used DAS modeling clay at all? One. Right. So I'll, I'll go through the basics of DAS to start with then. So what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to do a demonstration of using DAS. And we're going to go and uh, do the scribing as well to show you how to scribe DAS. And if we've got time, we'll actually do some painting as well. Obviously, we can't do that as a workshop because there's too many stages along the way on this drying tank and things like that. So what we're going to do with the workshop, you're going to work with the DAS, playing the DAS and uh, see how you get on with that. So, for those who don't know then about DAS modern clay, it's an air drying clay basically, a natural air drying clay. So, when you do use it, a word of warning, once you've broken the seal, um, you're going to let the, clay, uh, the air get into the clay. So, an advice is to get yourself something like a bulldog clay or something or seal it up each time you use it. Otherwise, uh, I'm afraid you'll literally come back to a brick. So, roll and waste it, get yourself a clip or something like that. If you're not going to use it for a while, I've just mentioned putting it in the fridge, that's an idea. What I do um, is I wrap it in a damp cloth and put it in something like a Tupperware container, something airtime. And then when you come to use it again, it should be uh, fresh as the day when you actually open it. So that's basically the clay is. It's a very soft clay, so it is ideal for scribing. I mean, a lot of people said to me, what about using plaster and things like that? Problem with plaster is it's quite hard, so when you scribe it, it tends to break away. With this, it's easy to scribe. Occasionally it does break away, but sometimes it breaks away in your favour when you're scribing it. Anyway. So that's, that's basically the, the clay. Material wise, uh, we've got some fun board, I believe, to actually fun. use. And we, uh, yeah, well, when we're doing the demo. But the clay will go on most materials, to be honest. Um, this particular building here, that is foam board on the gable ends and the clay is adhered onto that perfectly. Uh, and on the sides there, that's only very thin, about 1.5mm um, mounting guard, artist mounting guard. And it's, it's gone onto their 8K as well. Um, when you're doing a building, however, sometimes um, and this is what I get asked a lot as well. Will the building walk when you put the clay on it? And will the car walk? And the answer is, yes it will. But you've got to avoid that. If you want your building to stay straight, uh, you've got to decide how much bracing to put in. And just, not a lot, just stretch a bracing across in the centre there. Two pieces of corner bracing on the corner and not wasting anything, they were the off the off books from putting out the natural cable end. So utilise those as your, as your bracing as well. And we've got stretcher bracing across between the actual gable there. Without that, that cable would want to go right way. So that's basically um, how to keep the building straight. Uh, materials to go on, you've got to go on very, very thin car. And here's the perfect example. Just a very thin card coffee cup, and that's got a skin of dust put on there. And it is pretty tough once you've got the dust on there. And I've started to describe that with uh, rubble stone. If you come down to have a look at my stand downstairs in the demonstration area, I've got a building actually made from copper 
and I have made things like bases for castle towers and things like that out of coffee cups. So recycled materials, you know, are very useful and you can convert them with using the gas model in play. And when the painter um they look pretty convincing to be honest. Um, but when you're putting the dust on anything like that, what I found was that wanted to sag, that wanted to bow in, but I just left the lid on and that kept the shape all the time. So, um, right, what we'll do now then, we'll, I'll show you how to apply dust and then this is what you're going to do with the, the actual workshop. So, we'll start with the, with the dust and then we want... Have some cut somewhere. So all you need basically is PVA glue and water. That's basically it. So put two pots out one. See how much that's enough. You're not going to use a lot of PVA to be honest. Not unless you're doing it really large area. Uh, and the water. And you'll need a, a brush, but not an expensive brush, just a, uh, I think that came from somewhere like the works, you know, one of the cheap sort of shops. So um, about I'd say it's about twelve millimetres, something like that. But that's fine for doing most areas. And that's basically all you need. Now I'm going to put some on, on this. No, I'll put it on there because uh, that card, um, I think that came from the works. It's, it's artist mountain board. Um, well, that's good material to use because it's, it's, it's quite a substantial cardboard. Uh, it's roughly about three millimetres thick. But it's got canvas bonding onto the surface. So the canvas does help. Um, when you actually apply the materials on, especially the dust, it adheres to it very, very well. If you've got anything with a bit of texture on the surface, it, it's better than the smooth surfaces. It will take on the smooth surfaces, but sometimes it tends to come off, sometimes when you scribe it. But if it's got a texture on, there's no problem with that. So, what you need to do is don't put too much dust down at a time and don't put too much PVA. Be patient and do a small area at a time and then add to that area. So I'll just brush this brush a little bit. Go into the PVA. And I'll just put some on next to this dry dust which I've put down before. Next to there. And again, only take a small amount of the dust out at a time. It does go a long way. So, probably that amount is enough at a time. Seal it up. Press that into your PVA. Can everybody see? Then the thing is now, wet your fingers, uh, and that's where a lot of people go wrong when they're using gas. And it's the same principle. Um, if you think of uh, a potter, when they're throwing a pot and they're working on the potter's wheel, they'll keep the fingers wet and the hands wet all the time to work the clay. So exactly the same principle, wet your fingers. So we'll just wet our fingers and press that into the clay.
depends on one what scale you're working in. So if you are working in seven millimeter, you want it thick in, and if you're working in four millimeter scale. Uh, and secondly, of course, what material at the end of the day you're trying to replicate. So if you're trying to do stone and there's quite a bit of depth to the stone, then you're going to put some thick in the tress stone, for instance, or, or brick. So you've just got to have that in your mind when you're actually putting it on. But try and get it on as thin as you can, really. And especially if you're doing stone, by like putting it on with the fingers rather than rubber. Some people say, I've had a go and you know, I've rolled it on, but what not. Problem is with rolling, one, sometimes it wants to come back upon the road. And secondly, it's too flat. Um, with putting time with your fingers, especially doing stoneware, you're getting a bit of undulation on the surface, so it's not completely flat. And that's what you want when you're doing stone, you've already got that, which you've done with your fingers. So, that is how to apply it. And that's what you're going to have a go at, actually doing in the workshop. Um, right, the next stage of course is scribing the clay out. Normally I would say or advise you to leave the clay once you put the clay on, if you put it all the way around the building or you put it on the area you want to um, put the clay on, um, leave it for at least 24 hours. It's an air drying clay, so let it uh, air dry for 24 hours and then you can come back and scribe. Leave it over 24 hours if you like, you can leave it for a month, leave it for a year, and then come back and scribe it for uh, minimum 24 hours. So, so, you'll know the clay is nice and dry when it's got like a chalky surface to it. So, these are ones that I've cleaned on. Now, scribing out, obviously you're going to do, the majority of it will probably be masonry, uh, stonework mainly, probably, brickwork, you can do brickwork, but obviously it takes, takes time to do, um, but you can also do like ground effects, so uh, hard standing, uh, paving slabs, cobbles, various cobbles, so this is a model that I can actually scribe out and work on, which is um, it's 7mm scale, but it's, it's narrow, so it's, um, it's a Welsh quarry uh, diorama eventually. Uh, and what I wanted to, to do there is try and replicate um, slate cobbles that have been put on end on. So it's done from a photograph of one of the slate quarries. Um, but the beauty of using the clay is that you can mix uh, cobbles and, and, and flagstones and things like that together all on the same plane rather than trying to cut in or anything like that. So the same on a building, if you've got various materials in the building, so you've got a building where you've got brick uh, coins and then you've got an area of stone on there or you've got flint stones or whatever, um, you can do all that on one plane so you can create the whole effect of it. Um, so I'll just do a bit of scribing to show you how to start and show you the tools. Basically, anything that's got a point on you can use as a scriber. Um, the thing is experiment with uh, different things. I, I prefer to use a scalpel. Um, it's a 10A blade, but I wouldn't use the blade for cutting out anymore. Um, it's, it's gone far too long for cutting out, but don't throw them away because so long as it's still got the tip, the tip on there is perfect for doing scribing. So uh, the second use for your blade is for scribing. Now, you can, if you're using one of these, you need to hold the scalp in a certain way and there's a reason for that. One is that you've got control when you're scribing and secondly because the blade is in that housing if you put too much pressure on there the blade's going to snap off and that can be 
becomes too dangerous. So, so what I do is I scribe and I put a finger behind the house in there, and that way I've got control. So we'll just uh, show you um, how to do. I'll start by doing some rubble stone, which is freehand. So there's no definite shape to rubble stone. They're all various sizes. So you basically draw them. So we use your scalpel like you'd use a pen. And we'll start there. So we're actually drawing in various courses. The only thing you've got to watch as well is that even on the rubble stone, the coursing is going to have to be level. You know, you don't want your rubble stone going like that, for instance. So, so try and be aware and get your course in level. You want to sketch pencil lines on there first? You can do if you like, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're not confident to start with, what I'd say is, for anybody doing it, before you start scribing, practice, practice, practice. And if you're not, if you're not sure, draw things out first and then scribe it over your drawing lines. Especially if you're doing straight lines as well. If you're doing, um, uh, if you're doing dress stone or if you're doing paving slabs, for instance. Yeah, corner coins, anything where you know you've got straight lines, draw them in first. Um, and you can get a, a pencil will go, and I'll, I'll do it in a second, but a pencil will go on fine on, onto the clay. So we'll just start with the. Just do a few, and then I'll, I'll pass this around. So, now the other vital tool you'll need is an old toothbrush. Uh, because as you can see, as you're scribing out into the clay, um, the, the depth is building up when you're scribing out. So from time to time you need to brush that away. What I'll also do on there, I've got a pattern, you probably can't see because it's too small and it's white on one, but I'll pass this round. Um, but what I'll also do is a little bit of texture, I'll show you uh, texturing as well. So, Using the, scalp, uh, using the scalpel again, this time you don't want to hold it there because you want to sort of do a scuffing technique. And what you're going to do is pick a stone out and just scuff from side to side and you're going to create a great on that particular stone, which you do see in 7 nanometer scale in some cases. Um, I've got some samples here uh, at 7 nanometer, uh, 7 nanometer scale and you can actually see the gradient on there. So I'll just pass that around and then... do another one now and what we'll do this time is we're going to use a ruler and we'll do some flagstones and pavement slabs so and we will draw this out so let's um, let's get a pencil so just measure these out do them I'm just guessing in seven millimeter scale so I could give you uh, that seven millimeter scale rule and get it spot on but half inch will probably be roughly correct. in the parallel lines. And then we'll do each one, I'm just guessing this, but again, you know, measure them to get them right to seven millimeter scale. And do it to 20 mil. Yeah, yeah, have a look, yeah. Pass it around if you like. 
Okay, I'm going to say. So I've roughly drawn the pattern of the flagstones out now. And I can just go over that. Of course when you are scribing and you're using a scalpel, I'd advise using a metal rule rather than a plastic rule. Always always use a metal rule if you can. When you're doing a straight line, I hold the scalpel in the same way. I go from left to right, I find it easier to go backwards rather than that way. So you put the point on and scribe backwards a few times, three times to do. So actually using the side of the blade, not the actual. You're using the, still using the tip. Using the side, yeah. Yeah, but you're going that way with the tip. Yeah. So you're drawing it back. Again, practice with the with your techniques. And what I'll do, I'll, I'll try one with a different, see how we get on. But we'll try one with a sedentary pro look. So, and if I say anything with a point on, should do it. So, so if we do one with that. So we brush that out. And then we put in side of the slabs. So if you're doing something like a station platform, you're doing a street scene, you know, this is ideal. And when, you, when you're mixing them, what you can do, of course, you know, if you've got a kerb edge, of, in fact, I'll do it, if you've got the edge of the kerb there, you can put the kerb stones in as well. use that, that cord then to you know create the actual curve. And push that down. You can slightly texture these if you want, so just a scuffling on the surface. Just give them some texture. Of course Occasionally, a flagstone will crack and break down the middle, so we'll have a go at doing that. Again, I'm using a scalpel, but I want the scalpel to wander because I don't want to do a direct sort of line down there. So, if, if you just put the, the blade on and just, just let it wander along, and you get more of a natural. And what you can do with that is get the scalpel again up to the edge and just scratch away up to that crack and then you'll get the effect of that paving slab actually sinking down at that point which you do see you now. So there's some paving slabs so again I'll have a look at that one, take that one round. very often use the back of the blade you know, score. It's not easy to see. Yeah. So it's been a little tense to stop yeah. it digging in. Yeah, well if 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 that works for you, you know, I, I, but if whatever you feel comfortable with, um, if it works for you then yeah, that's fine. Is there any difference between the red clay and the white clay? So, sorry. The red clay and the white clay. Uh, I would advise that always stick with white clay. Yes, there is the terracotta colour, but when you come to paint it, you're going to have problems trying to get different shades on terracotta. You know, if you start with white, then it's like a white canvas if you're doing a painting. You know, then you can colour that any 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 shade you want to, really. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would advise use, using the white. Yeah. For, for that reason.
Um, I'll just do some cobbles now, free. I'm just to sort of like that. So, you know, this building's done with stone for the walls, but then, as you can see, we've got a cobbled yard. And it's like the, the cobbles that you find basically in a rural area where they're using the natural stone. So rather than, um, you know, in the cities and that, where they're buying in um, granite sets to make the uh, stone, right? But, um, they use the stone which was available from the local area. So we'll do some rough ones and I'll do some like granite sets. And you can do mixing, so I'll just do some. You, you mentioned works a couple of times, do you buy your dance at works? Or, or you, you can do, I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, it's probably cheaper than, than anywhere else, I mean it does sort of vary, so um, yeah, um, hobby craft works anywhere like that basically, of course, you know, there are suppliers here today who will sell you dance, I can think of three here today who will sell you dance. Sorry? Yeah, I think there's uh, Arbiologists, Squires, um, Islands Emporium, they all carry dust. I'll just do a small area, actually, of rough cobbles. Again, with this any sort of rough sort of shape. And then we'll do some next to it where you've got more. I'll do it free, you can use a ruler, but you've got like granite sets. Would you always work on your projects on the flat like you're doing now, so you, you use uh, elements? your building structure? No, no, not necessarily. Um, I can, you know, you work on a building, in fact we'll do this one now which is already made up. Um, just finish these off. And we can pass that around and we'll do some in situ. So they play very, very quickly but gives you the idea of rubble stuff. Uh, Paving and uh, like grand sets. So I've done that very, very quickly. It yeah, took a bit building. more time over it. Yeah, so if the building's struck, I mean, this is a um, <laughs> base for a water tower, an irrigated water tower built from uh, rubble slate, basically. That's what you see on the, yeah. you know, the Welsh navigators railways. Um, what I'd say when you are scribing, you've got to play all the way around. Start with the corner uh, and then infill from the corner. So, and this one, I do it for the end. And you've got, you know, your, your base structural stone is the corner coins or the, the stone on that initial corner. And the beauty is, again, you know, when you're working with clay, you're actually, you're actually creating that corner. So you're, you're taking your course and your stone course and actually around the corner. Which is difficult to do with embossed styrene sheeting when you come to do a corner. And you can even dig that out. So if you if you want it just a bit deeper on the corner, just cut into it. And then we continue that course there. So I think past that one you see that When I say it goes on materials, I want because we're times probably against it a little bit. Um, if, 
it will go into plastic if the plastic or resin in this case has already got a pattern actually embossed into the surface so it will keep to that if it's smooth plastic you will need to scratch the surface of smooth plastic to create a key to take the PVA on to take the play because it's got a pattern on it uh, you've got you've got to put PVA on in the first place anyway because it's got to adhere to whatever you're putting it on. I just just put the PVA on straight away. So um, yeah, I mean yeah, just yeah, I mean basically, I mean quickly do one find um, the brush again. Uh, PVA over there, right? So yeah, I'll just put some clay on this. Talking of scribing, the actual pattern on this chimney, I actually scribed in in the first place on the master. It's a, it's a resin cast from uh, Skytrex, but I, I scribed every brick on the course of that in the first place. It took a while, but. So that's just neat PVA on there. Small amount of clay. Same technique, just use your water. If the clay doesn't go where you want it to go, just put your finger and persuade it into the into the area that you want it to go to. So that's that's taken perfectly onto onto that resin. Yeah. So I mean, you could convert a kit. So if you got you know a, a building that's got a texture on it, if it's a plastic building. And you could add clay to it. I've done a, I did a four millimeter ratio uh, good shed, which um, it got a, it got a basic um, stone pattern on there, but I wasn't happy with it. I wanted more rubble stone to to match um, South Devon um, good shed. So I covered it in, in clay and re-scribed re it out, and it worked perfectly. So you can convert kits. I've I've created wire armatures and used that sort of uh, figures. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, it works all right, yeah. I mean, it's so versatile. I mean, you, you can use it for uh, landscaping as well. In fact, we've just got time, I'll just show you that. Because, uh, I'm, I'm sure, if, you know, obviously I was into figures, but I'm sure you could make trees and things like that. Um, I've used it for tree bark recently in 7mm. I've been doing work for, for Derby Museum. Uh, and. Um, on top of the wire, what we did was paper mash it first to uh, bolt the bark up and then okay. clay on top of that. Okay. Yeah, and then using this technique, we scratch the texture in with the bark once once the clay's dry. So, yeah, you can use on trees as well. Just put a little bit more on there. Let's see if I've got an old brush. They sort of recommend FEMO for it because FEMO is so expensive. It is, yeah. You, know, and you have to bake it in the oven as well, don't you? So we'll just wet that up again, and if I can find an old brush. Old brushes are great for it. In fact, the more worn out the brush is, the better sometimes. But you can just play around with an old brush and make churned up mud. So if you're doing like a farm gate or something like that, then you can do, you know, ground effects. Um, just using a coffee steerer, if somebody's rubbed a bike through there. Uh, and then the other one, of course, is using a vehicle, a Land Rover. Here's uh, the Land Rover's gone into there and reversed out. You get your tire tracks in, and once that's 
once that's all dried out and sold, then you can you can paint it. Um, you can also, if it goes down to the board, you can make puddles. Um, so it's, it's very versatile. So you can do ground effects as well as you know doing doing your masonry. Plus the fact that you can do um, use, use a palette knife, although you can get away with things like poly pop sticks, but. If you make a substructure using polystyrene, then you can use clay to make cliff faces. So you want rock cuttings and things like that, um, using the dust for that. So it's such a versatile material, really. Have you tried to do timber panelling with it rather than use lollipop sticks? Um, yeah, you, you could do. I mean, I've not you tried, tried it, but I mean, experiment with it, try it out. But yeah, I just want to see why not. I'm sure you've done most things so well. Yeah, I mean, it might be solid. Go. Quick, quick go. Then we must uh, Because while it was wet, you could do your texturing, couldn't you? You could do it that way, yeah. Or you could do it while it's dry and then um, texture it on just top. texture your grain in it. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, with it, you know, is. It's experiment. It's, it's, the materials are not not expensive, no. so um, have a play with them really and see what you can do. As I say, you know, do a, do a practice panel. Um, I mean, that's one of the great advantages of what you're showing us is that you could use very recently acquired support structures and gas on top, which isn't very expensive. No. You know, obviously the amount going into the well is such a thin layer. Yeah. Uh, but it's a heck of a lot easier, quicker and cheaper than waiting for the eBay to deliver your plastic card or anything <laughs> like that. That's all right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, not very, very cheap, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah. So when we yeah. see you hovering around Starbucks, we know what you're up to now. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. right, yeah. Yeah. They're all copy books. Yeah. Yeah, so now I'll just quickly I can't, we can't really do much painting because we're running out of time I'm afraid, but um i you can use acrylic paint. Um these this range is already pre-mixed. Uh, it's what Omen Miniatures uh, produced. And you've got all the various sort of colours in there, but I would advise really when you're doing, especially doing stonework, and great for, for that matter or any other, um, is not take them straight from the, from the pot. Still mix them, mix them on a the pallet. And um, when you say a pallet, you know, I mean something like that would be fine for doing a pallet. But I tend to use oil paint uh, rather than an acrylic. The reason for that, anything which is water based. It will work, but uh, the problem is your dust is very, very porous. So once the water-based paint touches the dust, it's almost dry straight away. And there's certain processes you need to do where you're actually blending colour. And with the oil paint, it just allows you to do that. It's still tacky. Um, and it will allow you to do these sorts of shades, build those shades up. So if you think about it, um, you know, in one stone there are various shades just in one stone, it's not just one colour. And same with, with facing bricks really. Um, you know, there are various shades even with, with brick. A pop engineering uh, bricks might be an exception, they might be just one colour, but even then there is weathering on those to a certain extent. So, you know, very, very, very the colour. Um, I tend to work with the multicolour first. So, um, with oil, when I say oil paint, the ones I tend to use are the artist oil paint, um, which come out of the tube. So they like the uh, winter and Newton, winter and range. Um, they're not that expensive, but, you know, you, you have to be a bit sparing with them. But, I'm saying that, you, you're only going to really need for your palette, only you need a few colours. Um, you can probably get away with a total of nine colours for most sort of effects. Um, 
and tend to go for the colours. If you mix it, go for the colours with the um, pigment that comes from the ground in the first place. So you're looking maybe like yellow ochre, for instance, um, burnt sienna, raw, raw uh, sienna. Uh, burnt umber, all those colours basically uh, come from clays anyway, from the ground anyway. So they're all good colours, but then you need colours to darken or lighten. Um, I don't use black, um, and the reason for that is black's a little bit too stark when you when you're doing those those sort of materials anyway. Uh, plus the fact that. Um, You've got to think that when you're doing a model, um, everything is reduced in size. So uh, your, your, your actual paint that you're putting on needs to be further subdued. Um, because your colours, when you look at the colours uh, in, in, in that sort of scale, they would be more subdued than they would be sort of bright colours. So bear that in mind. Um, I'll just quickly, if we've got time, just show you. And I tend to work with the uh, the gaps or the mortar course first. And the way I do that, just go in with grey is a very good colour because it, it 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 comes to a or it dries to a light grey anyway. And we'll just let a little bit of a small amount of paint out in the tin like that. And then we want white spirit or turpentine. Does it not matter which, which you use, whether it's no, no, white the, spirit or but they do exactly the same thing for what we want anyway. Right. So what we're going to do then is just flood that paint. Percentage wise, roughly 20% paint to 80% of your thinners or your turps mix all that up and make a very very watery thin mix as a wash of wash it oil paint and then if we add that to that stone coursing what you'll see is capillary action makes it run into all the Coursing that you've scribed there, but it also gives you a background colour as well to start with. Sometimes you don't even have to paint it, just hold the brush there and it runs in. And then leave that to dry and It'll probably take about 10 minutes and it will dry lighter than when you first applied it. And I think I've got a sample there that shows that. So it dries lighter. Then your next paint you're putting on, your dry brush. So again, mix those colours up on a palette. Keep taking the, the colour out, mixing it together. Have a tissue and take paint off your brush as you do it. It's a bit inseparate to start with, but just go, keep going over uh, in one direction. So the paint is then just going onto the surface of your raised stone or your masonry, uh, and it doesn't pan straight into the, um, the coursing of the gaps of the water line that you've already painted with the wash. Um, keep building that up. And take your time to get uh, the shades that you require. Try and get variations of shades over different areas of the stone. My final uh, advice is, and what I use, uh, I don't use a brush, I use my finger. Very, very cheap. <laughs> but um, take the paint off, off your palette, and press it in with your finger. And that gives that blending effect. Uh, and you can do weathering as well with that, so um, just 
just use it to get the right front right that would it. So just a quick demo. A little bit of the grey paint there, get your finger. And if you've got rain stain that's running down the wall, if all that's tacky, just get your finger and run it down. And that gives you the effect of the rain staining running down. So that's basically painted very, very quickly, but again, experiment with your painting. Do a practice panel and experiment with putting your paint down. Whether you use oil paint or whether you use acrylic paint, experiment and see what effects you can get. Um, and I also do, uh, just to finish off, light guns as well, using yellow ochre mainly. Um, put a brush down like a stencil brush and then um, you actually dab it on uh, or stipple it onto the area. So if you're doing lichens growing on the edge of a, a, a roof sort of thing, uh, just, just stipple that on. That gives you that. Any questions at this stage before we go and have a quick go at putting glass down? No? You know when you've constructed a building, if you, so that's fine doing your stiffness on the internal, internal interior of the yeah. house. If you're doing a two-storey, quite tall house, yeah. um, I've found that the foam board tends to move even a bit, right. and therefore I've sprayed the inside. But have you got a technique to kind of balance up um, the inside? With yeah, the I mean, if because you can get to the inside and back it up while you're doing it, that's yeah. one, one way of doing it. Yeah. Um, I mean, if it's a very, very tall building, you can always do the panels flat. You know, so it's a very tall building, do them flat like that. Yeah. Do all your, all your all your components flat, then assemble them, which describes all that. Um, and then all you've got to do is fill in your corners. Mm -hmm. So redo to redo your corners. But um, if you can, if you if you can do a building like that, you know, try and do it in, yeah, in, yeah. in situ yeah. if if you can. But uh, yeah, I mean again experiment with with things um, you what? get you, to stop it sometimes to stop it going um, you can get a bit messy if, 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 if you actually coat the inside with PVA yeah, as well yes. so one can cancer out the other so when you're putting the dust on the outside if you've got to it, do that and then yeah, when you've got the inside, floor in, yeah it, you could see it starting to move but so it's still moving yeah so I yeah. sprayed it and that tended to hold it yeah, well, if that works for you, then yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it's just when the foam board, you need something to compensate the drying out. You do, yeah. The dust, yeah. To the inside. Yeah. That's all I like. Yeah. Unless you're doing an old building, sometimes. I mean, you can yes. have a look at the uh, the barn. Um, and you want uh, that and the cottage on my on on yeah. my demonstration. Um, and uh, you know, on an old building like that, of course, the walls do bow out. So it can work in your favour, you know, if you can control it, if you want it to go in that direction. So, um, so yeah, but it, it's all about, you know, experimenting and playing with it, really playing around with it, you know. Uh, it, it takes you time and effort to do, but that's what this hobby's all about, it should be, you know. Um, right, shall we have a go at uh, putting some dust down then? Um, have we, we should have some panels, I think, shouldn't we?